All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I know there's a pretty competitive 11 o'clock slot right now, so thank you all. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about bootstrapping an architectural research platform. Uh, it's kind of a nebulous title, so hopefully um, those of you who are here uh, actually wanted to see what they think it is, and those of you who are not here uh, don't want to see with us. So, uh, my name is Jacob Torrey. I work for AIS, and today is the 16th, I think. Yeah. So, why did I do this talk? So, this is the point where after you either read this slide or listen to me talk, you'll either all get up en masse and leave, or you'll be able to tell your friends, hi, you missed this great talk. So, basically, uh, architecture, not in terms of like managing JBoss servers and enterprise Oracle DBAs and all that stuff together. Uh, I'm talking about low-level x86 architecture. And so I've noticed in the past uh, there's been a lot more research in this recently, uh, a lot of side channels, a lot of uh, um, work in um, other kind of low-level architectural work with you know, hypervisors and that kind of stuff. And I've been seeing a lot of duplication of work um, or people trying to figure out how to get to the point where they can actually do the research they want to do rather than just figure out how to debug uh, some piece of crap code that I put online. So uh, basically I'm trying to hope that when you guys leave here, you'll have a roadmap to be able to go from your research question, figuring out what you need to understand to be able to do that research, and then tools that might help you so you guys can do your work a lot faster. Um, so this is a very different format. It's not like uh, the, you know, the 40 minutes of background, the sweet tool release, and then the funny video of me hacking something, and then questions. This is a little bit different, so uh, feedback is welcomed. Um, Thomas Lim, who I don't see here, uh, he always gives me crap about the titles for my talks, and so this is a fake tweet of him saying how great it is. Um, so this talk does not describe any new research, really, um, and the slides are very verbose, and I'm not gonna read them directly because that'd be quite boring, but I want them to be published and as a read be, uh, leave behind. So if you have uh, questions down the road, you can pretty easily um, kind of grab them and see. So real quick, I work in Denver. Uh, I work for AIS. I lead the low-level computer architecture group, and I usually play in Intel privilege rings uh, less than or equal to zero. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit of background just to get everyone to the same page on what x86 is and the different kind of pieces out there. Uh, talk a little bit about the boot process if some people wanna hijack the boot process or modify that in some way. Um, talk about what you can find from the kernel. Talk about what you can get from a hypervisor. Briefly talk about system management mode. And then I'm gonna do a case study on uh, some of my work that was published at Black Hat a couple years ago called More. Um, it's TLB splitting on modern uh, x86 systems. And then I'll talk about some tools that I would have used had they been around then or had I known about them instead of doing everything myself and spending four months debugging uh, random crashes instead of uh, doing the work I wanted to do. So when I say I play in rings uh, less than or equal to zero, what does that mean? So starting with the Intel 3D6, um, they've added what's called protected mode and essentially what that is is that there are different modes of execution on an Intel CPU. And so this was back in the day before this, any application could go haywire and overwrite the kernel. There was no separation of memory and no process separation. Um, right now, really, the only ones that are used are zero, which is where the kernel lives, and three, which is where all the applications live. And this separation allows the, the operating system to kind of manage those processes and keep them from trashing one another. Uh, unofficially, there's also uh, minus one, two, and three, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, again, the higher they are, the less privileged. So ring three is not better or more privileged than ring minus three. Uh, the reason I bring this up is that you, know, you want to know which ring you should be playing in or writing your code in and what level of access you'll need to be able to do your work. Um, and then also, uh, the higher the ring, the usually the easier. So there's a lot better APIs to write code you know, in, in ring three in user space. There's like fancy GUI libraries, networking code. If you're trying to write your own networking code in SMM, you're probably gonna have to write your own networking stack. It's a lot more difficult. So if you can do all that work in user space, it saves you a lot of time. 
So one of the features also that came with this is paging. Uh, this is a great way that you can basically manage the memory. So every application kind of thinks it's in its own isolated memory space and it's the only process running on the system. Um, and that's using virtual memory. And this allows the more privileged code, so kernel or hypervisor, to basically isolate and then multiplex between these applications and manage, uh, you know, even you can page out disk uh, memory to disk if you want, um, or you can uh, kind of hide that or even share pages between different things. So real quickly, there's going to be uh, multiple page tables that you have to go, and the processor will walk these page tables. So it usually starts with a, you know, page directory, and then it'll get the page table entry, and then it'll actually get the memory. So there's quite a few steps in this translation process, but the CPU and the, the chipset does a lot of that for you. Um, another thing that's out there is the cache. Uh, you probably use this without realizing it, and you should realize how it works, even if you're just a software developer, because uh, by writing code in such a way that makes better use of the cache, you can massively improve the performance of your code. Um, so the CPU will default to accessing cache. Basically, it's the, the secretary or the assistant that says, I need this file or this piece of memory. And the cache says, yep, here it is. Or, oh, I got to go back to the filing room and get it. But it again pro provides it. Um, there's a hierarchy. Level one is the closest to the CPU. And then it goes down level two, level three, and level four optionally. Um, what's interesting about level three and optionally level four is that it's a shared resource. So you'll see a lot of work done, uh, especially lately with hypervisors, where you can actually um, use that across multi-core applications to be able to get information from one process to another. Uh, how the memory is cached, whether it's right through, right back, or not cached, is determined by some very complicated combination of registers uh, and the control registers, bits in the paging structures, and then there's some other kind of model-specific registers, the MTRRs. Um, newer CPUs have the ability to actually allocate the cache per core or per VM. So it's kind of a way to be able to more for performance than for security, but allows you to kind of isolate down that part of the cache to one guest versus another. Um, I'm going to talk more about this invisible things attack a little later, but uh, something that uses the cache to do a type of architectural attack. Um, as we showed earlier, there's kind of a lot of steps and processes to look up memory. Um, when uh, you're having uh, a virtualized system on 64-bit, it can be, I think, upwards of nine uh, memory accesses just to access a single bit of memory. And that's very, very slow when you're talking about uh, accessing a single bit of memory. And so they actually cache this virtual to physical translation in something called the translation look aside buffer. And it's really quite obvious. It's basically, is that translation already there? If so, fantastic. Otherwise, it'll do the walking and it will save it. Um, what's interesting about the TLB is that in, uh, in usage and logically, it's a single piece of a single component on the system. But uh, in actual silicon, when they built it, um, they actually separated it out into two or three of them. So there's an instruction TLB or an ITLB that's a little bit closer to the instruction fetch logic because over the lifetime of the CPU, that might actually save a little bit of time. And the data TLB is closer to the data fetch logic. And then on newer systems, it's actually a shared TLB, which is almost a level two cache for these translations. Another mechanism that you can uh, play with is the IVT or the IDT. So they basically uh, hardware or certain software events can trigger an interrupt and basically ask the kernel to do something on their behalf or notify it something's been done. And this is kind of the easiest way for hardware to communicate um, with uh, something that needs to be done kind of now or, or relatively quickly. So um, in protected mode, which is what most everyone is using, uh, it's called the interrupt descriptor table. Um, and then it's the IVT or the interrupt vector table in real mode, um, which is much easier to hook, but uh, unless you're in real mode very often, it's uh, not as useful. So basically the operating system, when it's booting up, fills this table in memory, sets a special register that points to that table, and then it has all these functions that can handle it. Um, uh, you can also use the interrupt tables to jump from one level of privilege to another. Um, so here's a quick thing from the Intel manual uh, showing how that structure looks. <laughs> 
uh, virtualization. So this is one of the unofficial rings. I don't think that Intel has uh, officially declared this as ring minus one, but if you hear someone say that, that's probably what they're talking about. Um, it basically provides a lot of the same features that the operating system has to manage applications for a more privileged virtual machine manager, VMM, or hypervisor to manage operating systems. Uh, I would say that the VMM and the VTX extensions are much cleaner than what the operating system has because uh, when Intel came out with it, they were using hardware task switching, which has kind of gone away, but there's still a lot of kind of cruft left over from there to support older operating systems. Uh, what's interesting about virtualization is really done in a very hacky way, so they would actually put the operating system in ring one, which is usually never used, and then they could actually uh, trap on some of those uh, more sensitive application um, requirements, and they'd be able to kind of do the operating system's job for it. Um, So the boot process. Uh, basically, as I mentioned before, the system begins in 16-bit uh, real mode, so it provides native backwards compatibility for uh, DOS. It's actually emulating 16-bit real mode usually, so it's a lot slower than booting up directly into 32-bit protected mode. Um, then legacy BIOS basically starts the process and gets things going and then boots, or if you have a newer version, you might have uh, the uh, EFI or UEFI um, which has a compatibility mode that can emulate BIOS as well. Um, so legacy BIOS will continue in real mode until the operating itself, system itself makes that transition, whereas UEFI will start in protected mode very quickly, and when you're actually running as a bootloader in UEFI, you're running in protected mode. So BIOS, when you first turn on the computer, there's some ROM or SPI flash that is loaded into segmented memory on uh, 16-bit uh, real mode, and then that will essentially get things set up enough to be able to load the rest of BIOS. It'll do the post, do all that text that you see about checking memory and other system parts, that'll happen, um, and it'll also set up the IVT. Uh, it'll configure system management mode, which we'll talk a little bit later, and then hopefully it'll lock it. Um, there's a tool out there by the Intel guys called Chipsec, which allows you to kind of figure out how good your BIOS is doing at actually locking that down. Uh, it's an interesting thing to kind of run. You can run it either from UFI or you can run it after you're up and running and kind of see, oh, look, you know, my, my vendor, my BIOS vendor isn't forgetting to lock this, and that could pose a way that either I can get into system management mode for my own research or that some bad guy could do that to my system. Then uh, option ROMs on PCI devices are executed, so that can configure like a RAID controller or a graphics display, and these were here probably will hook IVT entries, so if there's an IVT entry to say load data off a disk. If you have a RAID controller, it will hook that entry so that it can process that uh, using the RAID controller rather than just trying to talk directly to a, a SATA drive. Um, and then finally, it'll execute your bootloader, which calls uh, back into the BIOS using these IVT calls. And then there are also some IVT entries that are used to uh, kind of hook um, by the operating system so that it can notify you. So there's some certain IVT entries which allow you to kind of uh, see how far you are in the boot process. With UEFI, uh, some more type thing. Um, but then basically it immediately switches as quickly as possible to protected mode and it configures an identity map page table. So the virtual address at one address will point to the same physical address and it creates an IDT. Um, in uh, EFI, this is called, system management mode is called EFI runtime services, which allow you to manage or update your EFI um, from another uh, operating system down the road. And then also hopefully again, it locks it. Uh, it executes these option ROMs in an environment called DXE, driver execution environment, and then finally it loads uh, your basically PE formatted EFI applications, which might be a bootloader, or it might be some other application, um, and it passes a, basically a table of function pointers to the next step to use to access certain of these uh, functions, which we'll talk about a little later. So, when I hook the boot process, I find it's really easy to start with an existing bootloader. The simpler, the better. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but uh, you know, if I'm doing EFI, Shim is a program that is developed uh, to allow you to run um, Linux on secure boot because it's signed by Microsoft. And it's a really simple piece of code that basically has a main, 
which just loads Grub or whatever operating system you have in there. It has a little bit of code in there, but it's really easy to write your own code in there and also change those function pointers to hook. And they even have a couple of functions that they hook. So it's really, really easy to start hooking those function pointers to get introspection into how the system is booting up. Uh, when I first did this, uh, I was doing it on legacy BIOS. So I was using a very simple bootloader that would then call the BIOS to load the other bootloader. And I was just watching to see what was happening. And XP, their bootloader is very, very cautious about uh, loading one block at a time and then checking it one block at a time. And so we actually figured out the pattern of which blocks it was loading. And then we just load them all and say, yep, we're good. We're actually able to boot Windows faster than Windows was able to boot by itself. Um, so there's kind of two ways to do it, depending on whether or not you want to stick with legacy BIOS, which I would advise against, or reify. So you can also hook interrupts to be able to get information about what's happening, so you can watch uh, certain events. Um, if you're just doing the research, I would say Windows XP or 7 is much preferable, because patch guard will get very angry. Um, and it's kind of a whole nother ball game trying to bypass that. Uh, you also have to make sure that your compiler doesn't destroy register state. This is not a typical function call. You're actually um, quite more complicated, and so you have to make sure that your compile compiler knows how to compile that function. So, you know, in Windows, it might be uh, use the decal spec, you know, pragma decal spec. Um, also, you can do a lot of this stuff from a VMM, which might be a much easier way to do it. Um, the VMM can basically say, I want to be notified of certain uh, OS level interrupts that I want to uh, trap on, and then it can either uh, re-inject them um, or kind of silence them. So that might be an easier way to kind of bypass patch guard, and I'll talk about a tool a little bit later that does that, um, that allows you to basically trap on system calls uh, without um, angering patch guard. So there's a couple slides below that talk about what you can do with this kind of event hooking. So. So page pulse, um, if you want to be able to introspect into how the memory is being managed, um, basically whenever there's a mapping from virtual to physical memory that's not marked as present, it'll call this code. Um, unless it's cached in the TLB. Um, so if you change the page tables, usually, I would say 100% of the time during normal execution, you want to actually flush that TLB because otherwise you'll have uh, a mismatch between what's in the cache and what's in memory. Um, but an example when you might not want to do this, uh, the Shadow Walker uh, Memory Hiding Rootkit by uh, Jamie Butler and Sherry Sparks basically hooked the page fault handler to overload that single virtual address to be multiple physical addresses, depending on how it was accessed. So this is, you know, usually when you have a data read and you read the address dead beef, uh, you're going to get the same memory that if you were to jump to 0x dead beef. With Shadow Walker, that breaks that assumption, which is, uh, Quite interesting because usually anti rootkit tools or patch guard or antivirus assume that the code that they're reading out of memory and they're hashing and doing signature checks on is actually the same code that's uh, being run. And this shows that that's actually not necessarily always the case. Um, so it's uh, basically a way to be able to split out what is usually considered a von Neumann system with a shared data and instruction bus to one that is a, a Harvard architecture separate. Um, data instruction bus, which bypasses a whole bunch of defensive software. Another one is general protection fault, which is also used in memory management, but more for uh, access violations. Um, this was used by PAX and GR security even before that um, to emulate the no execute bit. So back before you could mark the stack as no execute um, in hardware, they were actually able to do this through software at pretty uh, minimal performance impact. And so what they would do is they would set the user supervisor bit and say this code has to be run in kernel space or this memory can only be accessed in kernel space. And then when that general protection fault triggered, um, basically if the access was data access, it would set the bit to allow it. So it would say that you can access this in user space. It would prime the TLB and then reset it back but without flushing the TLB. So now the TLB says that if you access this as data, it's all right. If you access this some other way, so in, as, as code, it will kick it back. If the type was execution or instruction fetch, it would either alert that someone was trying to execute off of the stack or it would just terminate as in, would in uh, normal NX. And so because of this, on older systems, 
how there's just two TLBs, you could actually have these entries kind of coexisting very nicely, and it would be a very fast switch between them. So you actually would have very minimal performance hit. Another one that's come really into vogue lately are performance counters. Um, so these were kind of originally designed to optimize performance critical code. There's a really, really long, like 700 page manual just on how to optimize code for Intel. And it's crazy, like the prefetch logic in Intel, if you were to run the same move instruction like four times on a certain region of code, it would tell the second prefetcher that that region of code is uh, worthwhile of prefetching also. And so it's actually faster to run the same instruction four times in a certain region of memory than maybe do something else, which the code it says is ridiculous looking. It's like just duplicating instructions. So uh, it, one of those things is the performance counter. So there's a whole bunch of them out there. You're accessed usually from ring zero or kernel, but a lot of uh, operating systems expose those for various APIs of varying quality. Um, and there's a couple examples down here. So the last branch record I'll talk about a little bit later uh, the cache miscounter, which uh, was used, um, and there's a talk uh, a couple years ago at Black Hat about how they could detect Rohammer. Um, so for those of you who don't know Rohammer, you should go read about it. Um, but uh, it basically, they were able to um, <coughs> exploit some uh, physical imperfections in DRAM to be able to flip bits, which they were able to get like from JavaScript to kernel space. So a uh, pretty devastating attack. And this was kind of an interesting way to detect it because uh, the, the way they were changing those DRAM was through uh, accessing the RAM directly without the cache very, very rapidly. And that would cause this uh, LLC miss, which is basically the last level cache miss rate, to go through the roof. So during normal operation, they have a pretty good bound on it. But during Rohammer, that would just explode. And so they were able to basically see that something like this is happening and then be able to block it. Um, another one that looks interesting, uh, that if you're looking for a future research topic, I bet you could probably detect Shadow Walker type rootkits if you were to look at the D and I TLB miss rate. Um, basically, uh, if you're messing with the TLB and basically enforcing that split TLB, you're going to have uh, differing miss rates than you would under normal operation. And so you might be able to actually make something that from user space or from kernel space could actually detect. Uh, a, a TLB splitting rootkit. Um, so if you're looking for a research topic, that might be one. Branch tracing. So uh, the LBR is an MSR that, uh, model specific register, sorry. It records uh, branches, basically the last few of them. So it's very low overhead. Uh, it's kind of by default that's kind of recording this stuff, but it's also fairly low power. It only records a certain number of the last branches. Um, so Intel introduced something called BTS, which is a much higher amount of granularity. So you can actually record a lot more, but it has pretty high overhead, like 20% performance impact. So that's uh, not so great. So the new CPUs, so I think Skylake and newer, have something called Intel PT or processor tracing um, that allows you to log control flow information uh, via ring buffer, either for later processing. So if you're debugging something and you want to know exactly how it got there, you could back kind of step through later. Um, or if you want to, you can actually do interesting stuff with it uh, right away. So that's something else if you're interested in uh, control flow integrity or patch guard or Emmet, um, you might be able to do that. And so there was some work called uh, Ghetto CFI and the latest uh, POC GTFO, which if you have not heard of POC GTFO, you should definitely check it out. It's available on Google. Um, and uh, talking about how you can do um, preventing uh, ROP just through using some of these really kind of uh, easy tools. So now we're into uh, switching from what you could do in the kernel space into what you can do from hypervisor. Uh, so VMXs are very analogous to an interrupt. Um, they allow the virtual machine monitor to basically get register a callback that is called when certain events happen. Um, the nice thing with the VMXs is that they're much more configurable. You've basically set what you want to be notified of. Some of them are mandatory, so like the CPU ID instruction, when that gets called, it's a mandatory uh, VM exit, which is an interesting way that you can actually detect if there's a hypervisor. So there was some work, uh, Red Pill, which just called CPU ID a lot and basically figured out, okay, it's a lot slower than it should be because it actually has to transition, save all the registers, transition to the hypervisor. Hypervisor has to either call CPU ID or fake it and then transition back so they're able to detect. Um, we had some work at AIS called uh, 
cash teller, which actually looked at um, the cash impact of uh, calling or CPU ID, which should be very negligible usually, um, but the L3 cache is shared over multi-core systems, so we had one multi-core thread that was essentially looking at that cache and doing a prime and probe um, look like they did at the MIT AIS attack, AES attack, and then we could actually detect if there was a rootkit in either kernel mode, uh, virtual uh, VMM mode, or even SMM um, from user space. Uh, one thing to note, which drove me nuts for a couple weeks, I didn't realize, but uh, TLBs may be flushed when you switch to uh, VM exit. So if you're trying to do TLB splitting in the hypervisor, um, you want to make sure you enable VPID, otherwise you're going to be very frustrated. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of different things that you can trigger on optionally. Some of them I find very interesting. Um, the hardware random number generator will uh, optionally trigger a halt, so if you want to uh, rootkit a system and then change the key generation, um, Intel has provided you a very nice API for that. Uh, moving to control registers, obviously, if you want to switch um, between protected and real mode or some of the other stuff, that makes sense, that would trigger uh, all MSRs, which is also interesting in that you might be able to fudge the performance counters. Um, CPU ID I mentioned, and then IO to hardware devices or CPU ports. Um, the timestamp counter, I believe there's actually features out there that will allow you to automatically skew the timestamp uh, counter to be able to hide the execution time of the hypervisor, so if you want to be very stealthy. Um, and then also you can trap flag or single step the guest. So a lot of these make a lot of sense. Uh, some of them I kind of have a sneaking suspicion is Intel trying to make sure that virtualization would take off even with Microsoft. Uh, I feel like they try to hide the fact that there is a hypervisor there. There's no way that you can detect if you're in a hypervisor without a side channel or without a way that you can the hypervisor can hide. And so looking at the licensing now, now Microsoft has got to the point where if you're virtualizing Windows, it kind of falls under the system license for up to, I think, four copies. But prior to that, I can see why uh, they'd want to make this a very difficult to detect system. So, uh, very similar to the interrupts um, for paging, so the general protection faults or uh, page faults. Um, EPT or the extended page table is essentially another set of page tables that uh, allow an, a virtual machine manager to uh, manage memory uh, with minimal performance impact. Um, there's an interesting project out there, a research paper called No Hype, where they tried to figure out the most minimal hypervisor possible that could allow you to run multiple operating systems, and they actually created one with zero lines of code. Uh, as long as there are no faults, so you pre-assign memory to each guest, and you have to modify the guest slightly to not call certain functions like CPU ID, um, but then you can actually delete the hypervisor. So if you're looking for a low attack surface hypervisor, that one might be the one because I think that if you think about how many bugs there are per line of code, zero is a pretty good number. Um, so whenever there's a form of violation, uh, you get an EPT fault. There's also an EPT violation, which is if you set the page tables up wrong. And so when I was developing EPT support for a hypervisor, I got that one a lot, but you're not supposed to get that one very often. Um, another way to do it is you can actually just trap on the page fault interrupt and you can manage memory preemptively over the operating system. So uh, if you want to memory manage the memory without the, the OS memory manager, um, that's a good way to do it. So back in XP, uh, you could manage the page tables separately and the kernel would not really notice or care. Um, you could do a lot of really sketchy things. Uh, but they actually really improved the, the code, um, unfortunately, on Windows 7 and above, where now they actually keep almost like a checksum or a hash separately, and it will bug check if you um, try to directly uh, change the page tables. So system management mode, SMM, uh, this is known colloquially as ring minus two. Um, it's kind of like the appendix, um, not the one at the end of a book, but the one in your stomach uh, of CPU operation for back when uh, DOS was first coming out. It didn't have enough space to be able to support every single chipset and how to turn the fans on and off or how to turn it down. I'm sure many of you in the room remember when you'd shut down a Windows system, it wouldn't say it's now safe to turn off your computer. 
is it didn't necessarily know how to actually shut the computer off. Now we've gotten a little bit further than that, so that's good. Um, so this mode of execution kind of runs in parallel and allows you for chipset manufacturers, they can actually load routines for turning the fans on and off, how to handle a thermal emergency, how to shut the system down. Um, and it can do that transparently with the operating system. It's the perfect stealth platform. Um, and so there's been a lot of research in this area. Uh, until about 2006, system management mode was just anyone could basically access it, which was rather frightening. Now it's protected. Um, so modern day systems, I mentioned already, use it for runtime services. So uh, this is a way that you can update the BIOS or you can call in and get information from non-volatile RAM. You can kind of look up and see what keys are in secure boot and manage all of that uh, after the operating system is run and the boot services have shut down. Um, this is the highest privilege CPU execution on the system. It has full access to memory and other than side channels, it's very, very hard to detect its execution. Um, I say it's the highest privilege on the CPU because there's also another one, Ring Minus 3, which some systems have a second processor running, even when the power's off, AMT, um, where there's been some research in there that that actually also has full access to the memory bus as well. So highest privilege that you can really get access to uh, on the CPU. So as I said before 2006, um, SM RAM was basically unprotected, so uh, very easy to get in there and, and muck around with it. Um, then that's been uh, locked with uh, write once um, registers in the hardware. So then they modify the memory controller hub to basically, unless you're in SMM, all writes or reads from the SM RAM region will get kind of transparently redirected elsewhere. So on older systems, usually it goes to the video buffer. So if you try to write to SMM RAM, you're gonna like corrupt the screen. Um, but it's better to corrupt the screen than, than SMM. Really interesting attack by Invisible Things Lab. You could actually change the caching mode for system management mode. So remember this is back to the kind of a secretary assistant that would do the all the memory management for you. Um, if you change that to be cacheable when it's usually uncacheable, you could actually write code into cache that wouldn't get flushed back down later until later and then immediately trigger a system management mode interrupt um, and then when, you, when system manager mode started, it would actually ask, okay, what's the code I need to start executing? And it would get it from cache rather than from uh, going through. And so since it never actually went out to the memory controller hub, you could actually get access to system manager mode um, through that caching attack. Um, so briefly, I mentioned that there's an interrupt that's generated called SMI, which is how you transition to system management mode. Um, the easiest way to do it, if you want to generate one yourself, uh, I believe the port 0xB2, if you write out to that using the out uh, opcode, will trigger an SMM. Um, you can also set up to do periodic or if there's USB traffic. So um, a lot of the early boot process for uh, keyboard, so when you're typing on the keyboard in the, in the BIOS screen, doesn't necessarily have a USB driver. So system manager mode is kind of emulating that as if it's a PS2 uh, connection. And so that's why if you uh, replace the SMM handler, um, you won't be able to type very easily in uh, in early boot. So we had that problem when we'd crash Windows XP, we'd restart, but we'd have already replaced the boot uh, the SMM handler, and we couldn't necessarily go in and say boot Windows normally or in safe mode. That SMM handler will handle whatever interrupt there is. So a lot of times it's very benign things. So advanced power management or a call from EFI runtime services. And then when it's done, it runs the RSM, the resume instruction or resume for system management mode. Um, what's really interesting and it's just now kind of coming out to light is the system management mode can actually execute a second hypervisor in parallel with whatever virtual machine you're running um, or virtual uh, hypervisor you're running in the normal executive mode. Um, when this came out, it was called dual monitor mode, and there was a very, very short kind of couple paragraphs in the Intel manual saying this is possible, but not how to do it. Um, now they've renamed it to the SMM transfer monitor and open sourced a reference implementation. So if you're really curious to see how you could actually lock down SMM, um, and in, in the ideal world, you'd have two hypervisors working in concert to both protect uh, the executive mode from a rogue SMI handler, 
and then a uh, you know, platform from rogue uh, operating systems. That being said, uh, the reference implementation is available online at that link, but I've never seen it or heard of it being deployed, so uh, your mileage may vary. All right, so um, now we're gonna kind of transition that you have some background. Uh, this is a good point. If anyone has any questions on anything, I know this is a bit of a fire hose, so maybe some of you guys are uh, uh, falling asleep and then the other half are a little maybe confused, but if you have any questions at any point, um, please just jump in. Um, but if not, I'll continue. I gave a talk on a low-level uh, bug in the PCI Express specification that allowed you to break out of virtual memory in uh, any system with PCI Express. And I asked, are there any questions partway through? No questions. And I asked at the very end, are there any questions? It was right before the bar, open bar, so no one had any questions, of course. I said, all right, see you guys at the bar. And then almost everyone lined up to ask me the same clarifying questions. They were embarrassed one after the other. So please, uh, don't, don't be that. <laughs> all right, yes. So you mentioned uh, uh, using ST. You mentioned... Uh, Um, you mentioned using uh, the STM to uh, lock down the SMM. Um, does, that get, uh, does that allow you to protect against tricks like the, uh, the, you know, the black hole in attack, where they were uh, re-windowing memory to get around the SM, uh, or the, the memory controller? Um, does that protect against that, or is that still an issue? So uh, I'll repeat the question real quick. So basically, does the STM protect against the black holing attack that uh, Christopher Domus presented at Black Hat 15, I think? Um, kind of. So uh, the black holing attack you can prevent very easily with like one line of code uh, in a hypervisor. And so, you know, Intel's like perfect model secure system is one with both a hypervisor running and a system management mode hypervisor running. Um, and that would basically block that write to remove that APIC, which is a very legacy feature which you'd never want to do anyways. Um, so you could definitely block that. Um, but also what you did is say if that wasn't blocked by hypervisor and then you were able to change how system management mode was behaving um, with the STM, you could actually kind of lock it down to only do certain things. So you'd be able to then trap to the STM and say, well, that's kind of strange. Why is it trying to do this? So. Um, that would be just another kind of wrapper around that. And so... So it would be like a case of like uh, cross-monitoring? Yep, and so there actually is a, the ability to call from one hypervisor to the other and to either communicate saying, hey, something's going on, or you could actually kind of uh, give it a, um, a launch control um, protocol if you're doing a trusted boot. And you could basically say, these are kind of the con constraints on that system manager mode handler I want because I think after the like, I don't know, fourth time invisible things broke into system management mode, uh, Intel was like, all right, fine, we'll, we'll figure this out. So, uh, <laughs> great question. How do any of these uh, f features differ if the system is running a uh, secure enclave at the same time? So SGX is uh, quite interesting in the sense that, um, for those of you who don't know, SGX or secure guard extensions or enclaves is basically a way that you can run uh, code kind of encrypted even to the operating system. Um, so it makes it very, very difficult to in introspect on what's going on. Um, what's interesting about SGX is that the enclaves can only protect user space code. Um, but they require the uh, cooperation of ring zero to um, actually start them up. And so if you're thinking about the perfect malware, it might be kind of difficult in the sense that the operating system could basically say, I don't want to run any SGX enclaves, um, or it's not signed the way I want it to be signed. Um, but SGX does provide on CPU memory encryption, um, and that is uh, pretty well protected. Um, I'm really curious, we're kind of looking at uh, another open research project, if anyone's interested, to see if you could do some of the same level of cache side channel attacks uh, through SGX. There's some caveats in the manuals that say they don't necessarily protect against cache access quite the same way. Um, so that might be an avenue for attack. but. 
Uh, SGX is kind of uh, more on the user space side, not necessarily at these levels. Um, but the nice thing is, is that once you're in the Enclave and you've initialized, um, you can kind of block yourselves out of um, being introspected through uh, the operating system or higher. All right, so quick case study. Um, the work I did a couple years ago called More, I did it uh, for Mudge at DARPA on a cyber fast track program. Um, my code, which is very bad, and I still get emails to this day asking how to even get it to compile, um, is right there if you're interested. So basically what I wanted to do uh, was do TLB splitting, so in the same kind of uh, you know, model as both Shadow Walker and the Bax GR security, but I wanted to do it for defensive purposes. I wanted to look for code injection attacks or more specifically, I wanted as, a, as running as an STM, so hypervisor in system management mode, could I detect if system management mode code itself, the handler, was being modified? So right now, uh, you can't necessarily measure that handler because it has a lot of real mode code, so data and code are interleaved on the same page. And so if you were to hash that, you know, say every one second you hash system management mode, um, it'll change and you're not sure if that's because the data has changed or the code has changed. And so what I thought, oh, okay, if we could do a TLB splitting, that code should never change, and so that I can actually put all the code access to a, like a, you know, a read-only, really nice execution page that I could hash ad nauseum, and then all data writes, either malicious ones that are trying to inject into system management mode will get written to a data copy and never get executed, as well as these variables will get written onto another one. Um, so that was kind of my, my goal. Um, what I found out about uh, a month and a half into a four month effort is that this picture right here is only for old CPUs uh, prior to uh, the Core i series. Um, so now there's another level two cache called the STLB that basically is a uh, bi-directional data flow between the instruction and the data TLBs. So I can't actually split uh, the TLB on modern systems. So that was a little uh, frustrating setback considering I was um, already under, under contract. So that's the challenge, right? And so um, what I had to do is I had to be able to uh, trap on memory accesses and then differentiate between code and data fetch. So at the page fault level, um, you can actually figure out if the faulting EIP was the same address as that that was the faulting address. And if so, then that was a code access. If not, then it was a data access. So that's, that got, got that pretty easily. Um, I was doing this on Windows 7, so I had to be able to manage memory without OS interference, um, because otherwise it would bug check, so that was a little bit more difficult. Um, I wanted to minimize performance impact. I was able to get, at the end of the project, about 2% performance impact to maintain the split. Um, and I was giving myself the challenge that I couldn't like recompile the code to like separate out the code and the instruction things. I actually had to uh, make sure that it was a mixed um, application. So what did I do? I built a thin hypervisor that supports modern OS. So I basically used a rootkit um, and I had to add VPID support to prevent TLB splushing, uh, flushing during the VM exit. And then I had to get more granular than what the page tables allow you for. So the page tables allow you to basically say this is read only or write only or it can only be accessed through kernel space. Uh, what's interesting is that EPT, the extended page tables that hypervisors can use, can actually specify execute only, read only, or write only, or any combination or some combinations thereof. And so I could actually say this region of memory is execute only or data access only, which would allow me to see if the code is being accessed in the wrong method. Um, since I was under the gun, I really wanted a small code base. And Zen and KVM are great projects and they're really good for virtualization, but not necessarily for virtualization research in the sense that coming up to speed on a 150,000 line program uh, is really not what I wanted to do with three and a half months left. So I wanted to spend as little time learning code rather than testing my hypotheses and figuring out what it would be like if you could do this. So um, that was kind of my critical need. So when I did it, um, I basically used the old Shadow Walker code um, for a driver for Windows 7. I found out that there's this STLB and I got really upset 
and also Windows would blue screen when you were changing the paging structures without its permission. So I took a, a VMX rootkit that was on rootkits.com, cleaned it up, and then I had to add uh, support for EPT and VPID, which was probably one of the harder parts. Um, I had to email with some of the Zen developers. There's like one or two people who have ever implemented some of this stuff, uh, at least about that time. And so I had to wait for them to get back to me and tell me why it was randomly crashing about four to seven seconds after I had done something. Um, and then I had to add the kernel callbacks for new process creation. And then I had to create a really insecure, I mean ad hoc, uh, hypercall API so that I could communicate between ring zero and, and ring minus one. Uh, due to the fact that I was using this rootkit, um, I was kind of stuck with hard-coded data structures for 32-bit without uh, a page extension, so um, quite an old system, and I even had to change it so that Windows would use less than uh, two gigabytes of memory. I didn't have time to fix it, so that's what I did. If I were doing it now, uh, there's now a hypervisor out there called Bearflank. Uh, it's under active development. Um, a lot of the features will be uh, improved and added upon by the end of the year. Um, basically, it's open source hypervisor, provides a scaffolding, I'll break all this stuff down. So first, open source, okay, so it's online, you can go grab it. It's lightweight, so it's 10,000 lines of code, of which I would say like the vast, oh no, an empty parenthesis. Um, the vast, vast majority of it is unit tests. It has 100% code coverage. It passes all the coverity, static analysis checks. This thing was developed from the ground up to be something that's pretty solid. Um, so of this like 10,000 lines of code, the hypervisor itself is a fraction of that. Um, if you're not researching how VTX extensions work, this is a great tool to be able to actually focus on doing your research. It supports Linux and Windows currently and OS X by the end of the year, hopefully. So the nice thing is, is that it's written in C++, which is, for me, not a nice thing, but it's nice for some people. Um, it allows you to really easily extend it. So you can actually just subclass the hypervisor and say, I just wanna change this one thing. And so if you wanted to add VPID support to Bearflank, there's an example of a hypervisor that adds support for VPID. It's less than 10 lines of code. It's actually like two. Um, it's really impressive that you can just subclass hypervisor and then just add in another callback. If you wanted to add selective MSR trapping, say you want to muck with the performance counters, uh, less than 25 lines of code, plus whatever you know, mucking around you want to do. So it's a really easy way to basically extend a hypervisor to do what you want to do without having to worry about all of the hypervisor work itself. If you want to just use the hypervisor's introspective power to spy on other process or you know, debug malware or something like that, uh, look into libvmi. It's basically an abstraction layer that supports a whole bunch of different VMMs, so like Zen, uh, QEMU, KVM, uh, bare flank support is, is hopefully coming. Um, and it basically allows you to write a user space program that can spy across the VM onto another application. Um, uh, Tomas and I gave a training at Troopers earlier this year, which has all the, pr the things we gave. Um, good jumping off point, we actually had like a crack me, um, capture the flag challenge where you had a program that would randomly generate a key from a whole page of memory um, and then you'd have to be able to figure out what that key was to get access to the system. And so what you could do is you could actually very granularly trace memory accesses and figure out where it uh, in that memory buffer it was accessing that key. And from a user space program that you wrote, you know, in C++ and if it crashes, it's not the end of the world or C, um, you can actually do a lot of interesting stuff. So you can trace, modify, trap on execution of software um, from another guest. Um, so that's a really cool tool as well. Uh, Simplevisor, uh, made by Alex Onoescu, from, I think that's how you pronounce his name, from CrowdStrike. Basically, he got really tired of the Intel software developer manuals, which are hundreds of pages long and are a little vague, and basically made the smallest VMM possible that can boot Windows or run on with Windows. And so it's 10 lines of code in assembly and then less than 500 or so in C. Very, very small. Um, if you're trying to figure out how things actually work for VTX, or if you're trying to do a VTX specific research effort, 
this might be a good place to go. It's basically a manual that's way better than any manual because you can just figure out how everything works and it's nicely documented. Um, another nice thing is this can run while Windows is executing. So you can basically start up you know, your system normally and then run this and then you can virtualize the system and then be able to introspect for a little while and then come back down. Um, similar to that is uh, Hyper Platform, which is made by uh, Satoshi Tonda. Um, similar to this, but is more robust and extensible for Windows virtualization. So he has another one called DDI Platform, um, which uses this and it's an extension of this that allows you to uh, bypass patch guard and trap on certain features. So I see I'm down to 10 minutes. Thank you. So Hyper Platform and Bare Flank, they're actually kind of merging, so they're both working together. So you should be able to do similar type things in Bare Flank uh, down the road, and this will be basically an extension to Bare Flank. Um, so if you're interested in those kind of things, uh, expect that by the end of the year. Another nice thing out there is a skeleton kernel driver. So if you want to have access to Ring Zero, so I've written a lot of kernel drivers, but I have no idea what the Microsoft APIs do. I have someone else try to help me with that. But if you need access to Ring Zero to be able to you know, run shell code, um, usually you get a Linux or a Windows uh, skeleton kernel module, and then you can use that and to kind of add in whatever you want to do. Um, I think Linux is a little bit easier because Windows has driver signing. You kind of got to reboot and say either you sign your driver and you add you know, a trusted certificate, or you have to disable signature verification in order to execute. So Windows used to be nice and easy. Now I would say it's a little easier on Linux. Uh, GNU EFI provides a way to do EFI application development very, very quickly. It's basically you just define EFI main and include you know, EFI, um, and then you can write an application that gets compiled to the PE format that is needed, and then you can run that either uh, in KVM through OVMF, which is the open source uh, virtualized uh, e EFI implementation, or you can even just grab the reference implementation, which almost everyone else has already grabbed, and then just put their logo on it and resold it. Um, that's available, but it's a big code base. Um, and then lastly, I mentioned this earlier, the shim Linux loader. So back before um, when you have secure boot and you want to be able to boot Linux, um, now a lot of the Linux loaders are signed by Microsoft or signed by keys that Microsoft trusts. I think that Microsoft has leaked some, lost some keys recently anyway, so you could probably sign them yourself. Um, it's a great way to see how you can run code in EFI, hook those certain functions, and then it already has code to pass those modified functions on to the next loader. So you can run Linux uh, with a hooked um, EFI boot service function very easily. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about, so puffs. Um, very quickly are physically unclonable functions. Basically, it's a, a method to expose variance when building uh, ICs, so when you're building a chip. Um, sometimes there are a few atoms bigger or smaller between the next one, um, and so you're gonna get uh, device-specific responses if you can find a way to expose that information through software. Um, obviously, they're very hardware-specific because you're talking about, you know, literally in some cases, a couple extra atoms here or there. Um, and they're also very varied by temperature and the hardware age. Uh, so this is mostly academic research thus far. I think that there's a lot of exciting stuff coming out. So I'm going to be releasing PuffLib in the next month or so, which provides an abstraction layer and all the error corrections. So if you want to develop a new Puff, say you think there's another way you can do it, or you have a new hardware platform, like say a mobile device that you think you can find a Puff in, this does all the error correction for you and provides a really simple seal and unseal API. And we hopefully uh, will be able to release also a source of Puff that's available kind of everywhere, uh, every system with RAM for the for most case. Um, so that'll be kind of the first Puff that we know of that's available on almost every system rather than just specific systems. All right, so to wrap up, as I think we're down to the last few minutes, um, figuring out what you need to be able to answer your research question is the first step. And then hopefully, you know, you can figure out from that what privilege level, you, whether you need to run in kernel space, hypervisor mode, or you, whether you need to find a system that can support core BIOS and run in system engine mode. Um, so that's hopefully what this kind of gives you a roadmap for. Um, there's a lot of interesting projects in this space, and I think there's a lot more tools that are being made public.
Um, for a while it was very academic and one of my frustrations is that they say we build a system and then they show how great that system is and that system never exists out in the public so now that's kind of improving. Um, I think IRC and Twitter has a good resources. Um, the OS Dev uh, Wiki um, also has a lot of great information for people who are building operating systems, but it also has a lot of documentation for uh, how those actually work. And I hope this helped, um, basically sharing all my experiences and frustrations. Uh, I still get emails today about people complaining about how I can't get more or, or hairs to work. And so uh, hopefully this will help you say, well, don't use my code, use someone else's much better. Um, so with that, thank you very much. And uh, tweets are already coming in. This one came out from tomorrow. Um, so again, Thomas missed it, but that's all right. I'll put words in his mouth. So thank you. So we have a couple more minutes for questions. Anyone has any?